Hey everybody, I'm Tim Mooney with the Timothy Mooney Repertory Theater. So today, I'm continuing on with another of our series on Hamlet. This time, focusing on what may be the most famous speech of all time, to be or not to be. I perform To Be or Not To Be as part of my one-man play, Breakneck Hamlet, which I'll be performing live online Sunday and Monday, October 4th and 5th, 2020, 8 p.m. Central. You can catch it as a pay-whatever-you-want event on Facebook Live on Sunday and for just $5 on Zoom on Monday. My plan here is to shine just a little more light on this great speech. So here's I Finally Get To Be or Not To Be. To be or not to be always seemed impenetrable to me, like a black box where all that lay within was unseeable. Sure, I knew it had something to do with suicide and whether or not it was worth living or whether one should just say, screw it and give it all up. But that was about it because my mind shut down every time I heard it. And I wonder how many actors have actually performed this monologue without actually knowing it. But the day arrived when I was going to have to perform it. I had thought up a crazy concept for a one-man play in which I would be performing one monologue from every Shakespeare play. This was my play, Lot O' Shakespeare, which I'll be performing again on October 25th and 26th, 2020. And while I had already memorized and performed Hamlet's first soliloquy, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt, I knew that anybody coming to a see a show promising one monologue from every Shakespeare play would walk away disappointed if I didn't perform the most famous soliloquy of all time. So I got to work, and as almost always happens with me, the process of memorizing something actually makes me think about each and every word choice, and the process of thinking through those choices gradually pulls apart the threads of the fabric that make up that speech and re-entangles them in a way that makes sense of them. So there's that first line, a first line that everybody knows. Where do you start with a line that everybody knows? What do you do with a line that everybody's heard a million times? If they're anything like I am, hearing this line does nothing but tell my brain to shut down because, hey, you're not gonna get this. How do you perform it in such a way that it doesn't simply cue them all to go to sleep? Here's the way you're used to hearing that line. To be or not to be, that is the question. Obviously, I already had that memorized. I might just skip ahead. But wait, something echoed in my head. It's in iambic pentameter. I work a lot with iambic pentameter. I've written 17 new versions of the plays of Moliere in rhymed iambic pentameter. I speak it so often that I almost never actually have to scan the line for the stressed and unstressed syllables. It's like how 4-4 four, four time is for a musician. They see that time signature and they know but I'd never applied this understanding to this speech before. What if to be or not to be? That is the question. Suddenly it's an entirely different statement. To be or not to be, that is the question. That's a definitive statement. That's from somebody who knows the answer to that question already. But to be or not to be, that is the question. That's from somebody who doesn't have the answer yet. He's just figured out what's the right question to ask. Suddenly there's more action behind the speech because this speech is now going to turn into an exploration of that question. This interpretation has the second unintended benefit of not sounding like any other version of this speech that we've heard before. It's like a rock and roll song that you've only heard one definitive performance of. You may love the song, but you may also know only about 25% of the words. But then you hear an acoustic version of that same song. Suddenly the words aren't all drowned out by the guitars and you realize you had no idea what that song was really about. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing end them. Suddenly, the speech has become active, and Hamlet is an active participant in working this problem out. Will he suffer the attacks of living through one sling and one arrow at a time, or will he turn and fight? 
But then comes these six words. To die. To sleep. No more. There are at least three different ways you can interpret these six words, but to my ears, only one that makes sense. There's to die, to sleep, no more. It's so dreadful, I don't even want to think about it. Or there's to die, to sleep, no more. That is to say, if I die, I won't get to enjoy sleep anymore because I'll be dead. That doesn't seem quite right either. Or there's to die, to sleep. No more. In other words, I could die, which is like sleeping, and maybe it's no worse than that, just to sleep. In other words, dying is no big deal. Only when we take this interpretation do these next lines make any sense. And by a sleep to say we end the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to, tis a consummation devoutly to be wished. In other words, Sleeping is good. As the jailer in the play Pericles says, uh, those that sleep feel not the toothache. You don't feel those thousand natural shocks, that stubbed toe, that scrape, that embarrassment. Hamlet is feeling good about this strategy. Tis a consummation devoutly to be wished, to die, to sleep. Yes, he's feeling good about it, but rather than following it with no more, he chases down a different pattern of thought. What happens when we sleep? To sleep, perchance to dream. Even better, we cuddle up and drift away with dreams about, wait a second, I, there's the rub. Hamlet has thought of something that rubs the wrong way. Technically, this is actually a term referencing one of Shakespeare's favorite sports, lawn bowling, but leave that aside. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. So death, is a sleep, but is that sleep of death just like the sleep of life? Or might those dreams that come to the dead sleeper be nightmares? Once the mortal coil is shuffled off, might that not remove the protection from horrible, relentless, maybe even painful nightmares to guide one through eternity? As Tevia says in Fiddler on the Roof, I think I'd better think it out again. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long life. In other words, it is the respect, or let's say the perspective, of how death might be that leaves one unwilling to depart from life and forces us to endure every calamity along the way. And then we come to a very long sentence. If you've followed some of my other explainers about Shakespeare monologues, Here's one for you to check out. You probably remember that I notice lists in Shakespeare just about everywhere. And what Hamlet is listing here are those things that every man has to bear if he or she chooses to remain alive. It's a list of seven things. And not surprisingly, most of these things that Hamlet lists could easily be references to Claudius or Polonius, and in one instance, Ophelia, and how they have made his life at least somewhat unbearable. You're probably going to want to look up contumely, quietus, and bodkin. But more important, it's one sentence. Don't drop the ball until the sentence is complete. For who would bear the whips and scorns of time, the oppressor's wrong, the proud man's contumely, the pangs of despised love, the law's delay, the insolence of office, and the spurns that patient merit of the unworthy takes when he himself might his quietus make with a bare bodkin? In short, Hamlet is describing the helplessness of humanity in the face of those things that wear us down, little by little, year by year. But let's take a quick look at the spurns that patient merit, a man who is patient, meritorious, deserving, of the unworthy takes. The unworthy being those who, rather than giving to the meritorious that which they have patiently merited, spurns them instead. This has to be Claudius. 
Hamlet himself has patiently merited the inheritance of the kingship, which should have passed peacefully to him following the death of his father, but was rather given to Claudius while Hamlet was still on his way back to Wittenberg to attend his father's funeral. And then we come upon another long sentence. Who would fartles bear to grunt and sweat under a weary life, but that the dread of something after death the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others that we know not of. In other words, the only reason to bear fardels, look that one up, but for now just think heavy burdens, is that the fear of this great unknown, that thing that follows death, is an undiscovered country from whose born which is to say the boundary of that undiscovered country, no one returns. The, the Americas, by the way, were stumbled upon about 100 years prior to this play being written. It was still largely an undiscovered and perhaps dangerous country. Sometimes people would leave to explore and not come back. Likewise with the afterlife. We get no reports to tell us what lies ahead in that vast unknown country. And lacking that knowledge, we are confused as to what to do. And rather than fly to this new unknown life, we endure all of the crap that life dumps on us. And here we come to the final sentence. It would help to know that conscience can also be used to mean consciousness or awareness. In this case, Awareness of the possible horrors that await on the other side of life's bourne, which leaves us in a state of fear over what is to come as we continue to endure all that crap. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all, and thus the native hue of resolution is sicklied o'er with the pale cast of thought and enterprises of great pitch and moment with this regard, their currents turn awry, and lose the name of action. And so, the doing of great deeds is eternally frustrated by the very nature of one's conscious humanity. Hamlet has drawn out the eternal paradox of what it is to be human, this side of the boundary of life, and to be afraid of what lies on the other, thereby choosing to do nothing. Usually when I see this speech being performed, I have the feeling that the actor hasn't quite worked all of this out. Most actors get a sense of Hamlet in a state of despair, perhaps moping their way through a depression, feeling sorry for themselves. And they play the sadness, they play the moping. Remember what I said about the guitars that drown out the lyrics? Hamlet is usually drowned out by all the self-pity. Lose that and you might actually hear what follows. But back to that first line, to be or not to be, that is the question. This speech isn't about Hamlet feeling sorry for himself, it's about Hamlet actively working his way through the question, first figuring out what the relevant question is to ask, and then examining those factors that impinge upon anyone facing that question of being, and as a result, finding himself in the state of inaction. If you'd like to see this whole speech put together, you can see it as part of Breakneck Hamlet this Sunday and Monday, October 4th and 5th, 2020. If you're watching this video after that date, please swing by timmooneyrep.com for all of the latest details of the performance schedule or to book an event for your own school, theater, conference, in person or via the internet. So that's I finally get to be or not to be. Hopefully, your understanding of this will double your appreciation of this speech. If you enjoyed this, please give it a like and subscribe to this channel for more. I do these explainer videos just about every week, releasing them on Friday in advance of the coming shows. You can go back and see the first one that I did on Hamlet here, and more clips and scenes from Breakneck Hamlet here. We've also got a Patreon campaign. If you'd like to support this work, we are a not-for-profit institution at patreon.com slash timmooneyrep. We have giveaways of lots of swag, like this book, for instance, or this fun mask, and even drawings for free performances. In fact, today's the first of the month. I'm going to do a drawing right now, and the winner is Sandra Palombi. Congratulations, congratulations Sandy.
And this and lots more goodies can be found at timmooneyrep.com. Thanks for watching. See you on the stage.